Will you be remembered after you're dead? The Zedless Deadless podcast about obscure people from history with me, Izzy Lawrence. Hello and welcome to the Zedless Deadlist. I'm Izzy Lawrence and on this week's show we have the magnificent Mr Greg Jenner, author of the fabulous new book Dead Famous. So uh, if you don't know Greg Jenner, he has done all sorts of exciting things. He um, writes for horrible histories and the film as well as the um, TV show. He's also, and I'm very jealous, a member of the comedian's football team, which I've never been a member of. Not because I'm a girl. That's not the reason. It's because I can't play football. Yeah, can't play football. I know, it's surprising, isn't it? I look like the sort of person who would. I'm leggy. I could be like that man Crouch, but no. No, I just stick to podcasting and jiu-jitsu and all other manner of exciting things. I like jiu-jitsu best, I think, of everything, which is why I wrote a book called The Unstoppable Letty Peg, all about a little girl in 1910 who learnt jiu-jitsu from Edith Garrod. Do check that out when you can. That sounds like I'm showing off there. Well, I want, I want you to show off. This is an entire episode recorded up in Stockport at the uh, Being Human Festival. I, I did with um, uh, Professor Bob Nicholson, Victorian humour the joke man of joke fame he just does victorian puns what's our favorite one do you remember it of course you remember that episode of course you do here is the best pun ever what vegetable would a talkative goose allude to if you were trying to kill it yeah yeah i'll say that again to what vegetable would a talkative goose allude to if you were trying to kill it ah Spare a goose. Asparagus. Yes, best pun ever. And I've worked with people like Gary Delaney, Noel James, Steve Best. You know, I keep name dropping here, but I have a tip mine. You know, I've I've done this sort of stuff. So, you know, and I, I, this is the whole point of this conversation, though, is I am showing off. Why am I showing off? Well, comedians, we like to show off. Maybe you think musicians are the biggest show offs, but you're wrong. It's actors. Actors are the biggest show offs ever because they're just children who've made pretend, right? And then just make a living. Just playing pretend for their entire lives and going on about themselves and having their names really big on movie posters. Well, if actors are the biggest show-offs, then this episode is about the biggest show-off of all time. It is about Edward Keane, okay? And Greg Jenner is going to tell you all about him. I'm talking about my favourite ever historical celebrity. This handsome fella, look at him. Ooh, look at the eyes, look at the cheekbones on that. Ooh, yes. Look at that. He's furious, or is he sad? <laughs> he can do both. This is Edmund Keane. Edmund Keane is the best and worst human who's ever lived. Um, he is my favourite. He is the most problematic genius that I can think of. And I've, I've got a long list of problematic geniuses. I mean, we've got Kanye. We've got Morrissey. We've got uh, Jacob rees <laughs> We have Edmund Keane, one of the great actors of the early 19th century, one of the greatest actors of all time, a Shakespearean superstar, a pioneer, a titan, a titan who was five foot four. Now, this is one of the major issues with him. He was a very small man. Uh, over here, he is literally a very small man, because that's a statue of him that is uh, about that big. But he was a genius actor and a total douche, like unbelievable arsehole. And I'm now going to list all the ways in which he was an arsehole, but I'm first going to foreground it by saying he had quite a sad childhood. <laughs> so you've got to be, you've got to be, yeah. And this is why I like him. Why I like him is because his childhood is, is hard and weird and sad, and then he gets famous in the most astonishing way, in a way that, as a historian of celebrity, I did not even believe and I had to go and look it up because I was like, this can't be right. So he is like nobody. He is a, he's a travelling actor, okay, and his childhood has been very, very sad. His mum had abandoned him. His dad had unfortunately taken his own life. So he is raised on the stage by his aunt and his uncle, Edmund and Charlotte. So he's basically brought up as an actor, which obviously is a horrible life. I mean, who could imagine being an actor? Terrible, but the worst. <laughs> and he is small, he's weird looking, he's sort of furious. He's very good at back flips, he's very good at front flips, he's good at general flips, he can do all the flips. And he is basically made to play the harlequin roles, he's made to play all the sort of comedy roles in the Shakespeare plays, and it makes him furious, because he wants to be out the front, a tragedian, handsome, tall, elegant, 
is this Pythagoras seen before me? No, he's like in the bed, I mean, like little comedy stuff. And he's like, oh, I want to be, I want to be the famous guy. And it won't happen for him. And he turns to drink, and he gets more and more drunk. He becomes more and more problematic. He's a, he's a raging alcoholic, apocalyptic alcoholic. So the most interesting story is he gets in, he's, he's working in Birmingham. Can you see that, everyone? Okay. So he's working in Birmingham. And he falls out with the manager, because the manager's like, you're a terrible actor, why are you here? And he's like, I am the great Edmund Keane! I deserve better. And he said, right, I'm going to quit, I'm quitting, I'm quitting, I'm going to Swansea, I've got a gig in Swansea. And the manager's like, fine, you quit, you do what you want. So he says to his wife, Mary, we're going to Swansea. And she says, where's that? And he says, Wales. <laughs> and she's like, right, how are we getting there? And he says, walking. <laughs> and she is seven months pregnant. And they don't have money for hotels or travel or food, so they are sleeping in ditches, and in bushes, and in trees. She is seven months pregnant, and they are carrying everything they own on their back. <laughs> Five years pass, and he's still doing this. They get to York, they run out of money, they nearly starve to death. Uh, it's a disaster, it's a nightmare, they've got two kids. Um, and suddenly, out of nowhere, this raging alcoholic, who is a disaster zone, becomes the most famous man in Britain. Now, I know I've broken Izzy's rule, because not meant to be famous, but he's a superstar at the time. And he gets famous in the craziest of ways. Basically, the Drury Lane Theatre in London is a super famous theatre, really important, really, really prestigious, but it burns down, and they have to rebuild it. And to rebuild it costs a crazy amount of money, and then nobody comes. They're like, hello, new theatre, it's brilliant, it's wonderful, and no one comes. And they're like, oh my god, we're in huge problems. We've got, we've got massive debts. And so they are looking for someone, anyone, anything, to get punters into the door, and Edmund is acting in Exeter, somewhere in the southwest, and someone sees him and says, I've just seen the weirdest actor I've ever seen. <laughs> He's this tiny, furious man who can do cartwheels, <laughs> and his eyes are, like, I mean, just, his eyes are, like, raging. He's so angry. He's like a sort of feral cat in an alleyway that hisses at you. He's like a human equivalent of, like, a ghost that's inhabited an owl, and he's just very, very upset and angry. And so, they're like, well, you know, if nothing else is working, I guess we'll hire this random alcoholic man then. And so they do, and it works. It's the equivalent of basically like a Vegas casino saying, hey, Celine Dion's doing really well, let's hire a busker. <laughs> See if he does all right, but get to sing Coldplay song, it'll be fine. And, and then that guy literally becoming like a Coldplay sort of superstar, it's that level. So he becomes a superstar within a week. Within a month, he's the most famous man in Britain, more famous than Byron. He hangs out with Byron. Byron's a massive fan, Byron's obsessed with him. So he becomes huge, but he is such a tool because he's now going to spend the rest of his life just going, I told you so, I hate you, and you, you never believed in me, I'm better than all of you. So he founds the Wolves Drinking Club. He uses his members to boo any rival actor who snubbed him at any point in his life. <laughs> sits them in the front row and just gets them to go boo all the way through all the place. He also himself sits in the front row and sneers at anyone who is anyone who has like been rude to him, and that's just like a long list of people. Um, he fires any actor who is taller than him, all the actors. Anyone who's better than him, several actors. Anyone more attractive than him, most actors. He refuses to act with any of the other big actors of the age, and he surrounds himself with very bad actors, so much so that people go to watch him act. And they go to watch him because he's a genius, he's an extraordinary, raging, sociopathic, alcoholic genius who just howls and roars and whispers and laments and hurls himself on the stage and screams, and everyone else is like, hello, I'm, I'm in this play as well. <laughs> oh no, a man! And he's like, ah! He's just out of this world, crazy, romantic, he's a romantic actor. But he surrounds himself with crap actors, so that he is the only good thing. And later on in his life, he gets to actually run the theatre, and he turns down 500 scripts, because they are, unfortunately, containing speeches for other characters besides him. <laughs> he's like, but, but I'm not in this scene. <laughs> How could we possibly melt this? So he's an absolute arsehole. Pet line. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. Literally, pet line. Walks around London with pet line. I mean, you can't get better than that. Gets so drunk, he forgot that he buys a yacht. <laughs> so he's in the pub, a man comes up to him and says, do you want to buy a yacht? And he goes, sure, I'm Edmund Keane, why not? And next morning he goes home, wakes up in bed, the man comes to the door with the yacht. And Edmund's like, sorry, who are you? <laughs> the man's like, you bought, you bought the yacht from me. 
And Edna's like, no, I, I wouldn't buy a yacht. I don't live in the river. And Matt's like, yeah, you bought the yacht. Uh, and so he turns to Mary, his wife, and says, Mary, have you ever wanted to live on a yacht? Because <laughs> it turns out, I've bought one. <laughs> and she says, no, wait a minute. we live near, near, no, near the river. How would you get to work? This is a very bad plan. He says, yeah, it is, it is a bad plan, bad plan. So he pays the man to take the yacht back, <laughs> which is genius. He buys it, and then pays the man to take it back. So that man has done very well. He got so drunk, he, he uh, basically tried to watch his own play. <laughs> this is before he was famous. He missed the start of the play, so the manager of the theatre had to go on in his place. And the, the manager's not really good, he's stumbling around, he's trying to do the lines, and the audience start booing. And suddenly, out of the royal box, there is a loud voice that goes, Keep going, lad, you're doing very well! <laughs> and it's Ed McKean, in his own play, <laughs> watching his own play from the royal box because he stumbled in and he sort of he knows where he's meant to be but he's not quite sure he's going to be there on stage he's like i'm going to be in this theater i'm pretty sure <laughs> so he was fired immediately of course he was uh, so he didn't get an education as a child because his his mum and dad unfortunately weren't there and he was raised on stage so he didn't know latin or greek but all his friends were really really fancy posh people like lord byron and william Haslin, and prince george and so on so he pretended to know latin and greek He'd just get up and start giving a speech in a language that he'd invented. <laughs> and they'd be like, what's, what's happening? And he'd be like, well, Latin or Greek, of course. <laughs> they'd be like, no, no, none of this is Latin or Greek. Um, what's, what I like about it, though, what I find really sympathetic is that he was sort of working class. And he really wanted to, for people to respect him and love him. And so he would work really hard to get to go to these dinner parties, to sort of hang out with these people. And then he'd sit there, and then he'd go, I don't like these people, and they don't, they don't like me, I know, oh, I miss the wolves, I want to go drinking. And so he'd leave mid-dinner without telling anyone, and he'd just be found in Deptford three days later. <laughs> he would go missing for weeks at a time, and he'd be found in a tree. Or, in a, I'm not, not, not joking, literally found in a tree. <laughs> just got so drunk, he was like, I will sleep in this tree. Um, so his wife was like, where are you? What are you doing? Weeks at a time, missing. Um, he claimed to be the illegitimate son of the Duke of Norfolk, and the Duke of Norfolk had been his aunt's um, lover for a little while. So in his head he was like, maybe I'm the love child, in which case that explains why I'm better than everyone. <laughs> so he, he would tell people that. The Duke of Norfolk very kindly said, well, if he was my son, I would be very proud of him, but I know where all my children are. I'm like <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Love this one. He jumped out of a window on a dare. He did this a lot. Leapt out because he could do backflips and stuff. So he was very good. Someone bet him. I bet you can't jump out that window. He was like, of course I can. I'm Ed McGee. Leapt out the window. Landed quite badly, in fairness to him. And an old man rushes up to him and says, are you okay? And he immediately goes, aha, an audience. And starts doing a death scene. From <laughs> And the man's like, no, but seriously, are you all right? <laughs> are you dying? And he's like, oh, it's me, I am dying. And the man's like, no, but are you all right? And he's like, it's Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare. And the man's like, no, but I don't... Are you, you've left out a window, are you all right? And he's like, no, but Shakespeare. And the man's like, I don't understand what's happening. And he says, I'm Edwin Keane. And the man's like, I don't know who you are. I don't really go to the theatre. And in which case, then he stands up and goes, Never mind, gives him five pounds, runs away laughing. <laughs> That's the sort of man he is. He's just always on. He's, uh, and an audience is enjoying it. He's like, never mind, five pounds, goodbye. <laughs> I love that about him. One of the first ever celebrities to tour America. This is where he actually gets like really important and interesting. He tours in 1821. He goes out there to make a lot of money. It goes really well for him. Well done, Edmund, till he gets to Boston. And then he gets to Boston, and there aren't enough people in the audience. And he's like, well, I'm not going. There aren't enough people in the audience. I'm, like, I'm Edmund Key. I'm the great Edmund Key. Uh, and so the people in the audience start booing him, and he writes a sort of stupid letter in the, in the newspapers, trying to defend himself, but basically, basically calling Bostonians primitives who don't understand his genius, uh, and they they are furious with him. So he has to go home in, in shame and money. So he then has a massive, massive scandalous affair. He's always cheating on his wife, constantly, constantly cheating on his wife, so much so that he builds in special shag windows into his plays. During a scene, he can leave the scene and have fun in the dressing room with the lady of the night and come back out mid-scene and carry on with the speech. But he has a really famous affair with a woman called Mrs. Sharp Cox, who is the wife of his friend who works at the Brunei Theatre. And um, the man finds out about it because Keen, they write love letters to each other and then he pisses her off and she leaves the love, love letters for her husband to find and he's like, right, I guess I'll go kill Edward Keen then. So he loads a pistol, runs into a room and tries to shoot him, thankfully. 
uh, they wrestled the guns off him and so on. It becomes a huge scandal. It's a massive divorce case. He has fined a huge amount of money and he thinks, oh no, no one likes me anymore. I'd better go to America where everyone loves me. <laughs> Do they love me? He gets to America and they try to kill him. <laughs> Physically, actually try to kill him. He gets to New York and they throw up oranges at him and he thinks, well, this is fine, this is fine, I'm used to oranges, no problem. He gets to Boston, 600 people rip the doors off, the chandeliers off, the stage down, and bum rush the stage to try and kill him. They <laughs> physically chase him out the theatre. He runs down the street, chucking his wig behind him, and has to hide in a linen basket. So, these are his own fans. They paid to see him. <laughs> it's, it's a remarkable thing. He's a genius. He also murdered, uh, well, threatened to murder his own son, Charles. Uh, his, his first son died very tragically young. His second son, Charles, was quite a nice boy who Edmund tried to destroy. And Charles turned into a sort of quite a nice man, and one day said, Dad, I'd quite like to be an actor. You're a good actor, I thought maybe I'd be an actor. To which he said, the name Keen shall die with me, and throttled him. So, again, nice guy. <laughs> Basically, in short, total legend. <laughs> I mean, one of the greatest actors of the 19th century, genuinely radical, genuinely revolutionary, genuinely changed acting as we now know it. To this day, actors are obsessed with him, but not famous at all. No one knows his name. I've never heard of him before I wrote the book. And such an extraordinarily ability to alienate everyone in his life. <laughs> everyone. Wife, children, best friend, colleagues, co-workers, enemies. This man was extraordinary. He deserves more than a day. He deserves his whole year. It should be Edwin, should be Edwin Keen year of 2019. So make it happen. <laughs> A big thank you there to Greg Jenner and also, posthumously, to Edward Keane. He would have been gutted that he didn't actually win the Zedless Deadlist that evening. Ah, oh, the shame of it. The shame. Please do share this um, episode with your friends and family on social media, of course. Don't meet them in person. Be safe, unless this is the future, in which case, of course you can. You can go and hug each other. I'm very jealous of you. Um, yes, do share this episode. Um, you can find out more about me on isi.com, that is izzy.com, and you can hear more episodes on the zlistdeadlist.com, that is zlistdeadlist.com, not zlistdeadlist, Americans, okay. Mm, can't pronounce things correctly but that's all right because we love you anyway um so thanks very much i hope you are safe and if this is the future like i say please give everybody a hug from me bye